In this example, we're going to look at two hormones that we're probably reasonably familiar with. Uh, the hormone that determines whether or not you're going to be female, estrogen or estradiol, and testosterone. That leads to males. Now, sex is determined by chromosomes, X and Y, but when you get right down to the physiology of what goes on, it's really about the concentration of different hormones you get as you're developing embryo and fetus at different times of your development while you're in the uterus. Now, as you can see by these two structures, they have pretty much the same general structure outlined here in yellow. These carbon rings, and these are carbon-carbon rings, aromatics, or ring structures. We're not showing the carbons, just to keep it brief. And the only real difference in these molecules is, you know, on estradiol or estrogen, oh, sorry, uh, the functional group we've got a hydroxide and OH ion there instead in testosterone we've got the double bonded oxygen sitting in that place and then we add an extra CH3 so the general structure of these compounds is all, is exactly the same and all we've added is some some different bells and whistles some different ornaments and that gives them different properties and their different properties determine whether you're going to be a female or a male just by the presence or absence of those different functional groups. Now the functional group approach basically works because we don't have to know specifics so much about the molecules just by looking at sort of the skeleton we don't have to worry about it we just have to worry about what's attached to the skeleton to determine what something's going to do. It's very much in a way looking at zoology where you have your animals they've all got a pretty similar body plan then you look at the extremities and the external characteristics that sort of gives you a clue as to what certain things can and can't do. Um, each functional group has some pretty specific properties they behave the same way by and large no matter which molecule they're on so they give a molecule its properties or a set of characteristics and things it can or can't do. So these are the most common sort of functional groups you'll see in biological systems and we'll delve into a little more detail about uh, basically a bunch of these and the phosphates at the top. Now they're very very common you'll get a sheet that you can download that's got uh, a space for the drawing of the functional group that's got a space for uh, where you typically find it and some of the properties that it gives those molecules that they're attached to. Uh, you can see most of them involve oxygen that of course means uh, mo many of them are polar so they allow things to dissolve in water and that includes the amino group um, and of course the phosphate group with its phosphorus bonded to its oxygens. Now some of you may be wondering why this phosphorus atom here is bonded uh, to five different things. It has to do with the way the electrons are arranged in the SPDF shells that you'll take a look at in your chemistry class. Um, the only other thing that's sort of new is the concept of aldehydes and ketones. Here we're talking about this carbonyl group or carbonyl group as the British pronounce it. This carbon double bonded to the oxygen. And depending on where it is, it's going to give us two different types of compounds called aldehydes and ketones. And you notice this little R here. And that R basically stands for anything. So you could have a whole bunch of carbons there. But it it's something. because we And we don't really care overly too much when we're talking about them as to what that something is. They can be the same thing where it's just R or you could have sort of an R1 and an R2 where they're completely different things. In ketones the carbonyl group is sort of smack dab in the middle okay. and in aldehydes it's at the end so it's got a terminal hydrogen here at the end. Uh, if it's an ester you got this extra oxygen here bonded to other things and then ether sort of has this oxygen bridge and, and they all have their common things. We won't talk overly too much in this class about um, esters and ethers but the esters tend to uh, have sort of a, an aromatic properly so most of the smells you are familiar with from soaps and uh, beauty products and even in nature are esters so there's the strawberry smell um, pineapple smell, the mint smells, you know, spearmint and so on and so forth. That's Those are esters. 
and you'll actually, if you take uh, grade 12 chemistry, you'll actually make some of those esters, and you make the school smell pretty good for a little while. Ethers are very similar to esters, but uh, they're much lighter. Um, they were often used as the first sort of anesthesiist-type compounds when they did surgery. They would put a cloth mask over your face and, and drip them on there, and uh, something like dimethyl ether would make you go to sleep, would render you unconscious. The problem was dimethyl ether was extremely explosive in its vapor form, so if you ever had a, a small spark or a source of quick heat in the operating room, you could basically blow up the operating room and have a flash fire, which, you know, if you've got a patient cut open on the uh, operating table, it's probably not good to have a flash fire break out. Okay, so the common functional groups we're going to take a look at are hydroxyl, carbonyl, carboxyl, amino, sulfhydryl, phosphate, and then we'll see methyl. And we'll take a look at each one in the next couple slides, and you'll get a chance to write these down in their characteristics and see some examples. We're not gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time in the video talking you through it. You can pause the video and get that information as you come. But you'll notice all of them, when you see their structures, are going to involve oxygen uh, or polar type asymmetrical bonds so they're going to be polar type groups and that's going to mean they're going to be able to dissolve in water because like dissolves like and the word, fancy word we use for that is hydrophilic and hydro of course means water and philic means I'll try and draw a heart here that means to love so if you're hydrophilic you love water and if you're hydrophobic you are afraid of something because a phobia is something you don't like. So you're afraid of something and you're afraid of water. So hydrophilic materials are those that are polar, so they will dissolve in water. And hydrophobic mo molecules are, we'll just use NP for nonpolar. And those are just a slightly different way of talking about polar and nonpolar. It's just a fancier word. Okay, so the hydroxyl group um, always ends in OH. Okay? Um, that's kind of like a bit of a water molecule. Makes it really, really polar, of course. Um, we tend to see the OH groups attached to lots of different things. The more OH groups you have in general, the more polar you are, so the more the better you dissolve in water. And carbon hydrocarbon skeletons, CH skeletons with OH groups on them, if it's just an OH group, there can be other things, but it's going to be an alcohol. So something like isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol. The isopropyl just talks about the number of carbons and the way they're arranged in space. The OL tells you that there is an OH group, a hydroxyl group at the end. Okay, and then we've got the carbonyl group, this carbon double bonded to the oxygen. And depending on where that is, it's going to give you the concept of aldehydes and ketones. If our carbonyl group is at the end of a hydrocarbon chain, it's an aldehyde. If it's someplace in the middle, it's going to be a ketone. And it, it doesn't look like there's a big deal. Um, these things are isomers. We talked about isomers before, so they'll have the same structural form, or sorry, same molecular form, the same recipe, but they'll be arranged differently in three-dimensional space. Um, they will have slightly different properties, especially when we get to the carbohydrates with sugars. There's aldehyde and ketone sugars, and these aldehyde and ketone sugars uh, form up differently when you throw them into water, and they get different structures that are very, very useful for different reasons. Okay, so here we have the carboxyl group, uh, the COOH, and oftentimes when we're in water, we're going to lose that oxygen. Uh, the carboxyl group's very, very polar again. Um, they give us the carboxylic acids, and car the carboxylic acids can also be written with the suffix H. So anytime you see any ic acid, and you can sort of say that any 8 is an ic acid, and we'll go over this a lot when we go into metabolism because the names will become important and we'll have to know all those names in, in, in the cell respiration pathway and sometimes on handouts or diagrams you'll see something as eight and something as an ic acid and people want to know the difference it, it's really the same thing um, the other place that we'll take a look at carboxylic acids is when they're ionized so when it's put in water we lose the hydrogen and you can see we've got COO well that's CO2 and that's where the carbon dioxide comes from when you and I exhale it comes from our food our carbohydrates that we've ingested we put them through cell respiration we break off carboxyl groups and those carb carboxyl groups with the carbons come off in our exhaled breath 
Our next one is our amino group, our, our NH2, NH3, depending on when we put it in water. And again, it's because that hydrogen, that nitrogen, sorry, is very positive, or sorry, ne very negative, and it'll attract a positive proton there that'll kind of hang around it. But we tend to see it as NH3, and that gives some things, some polar properties. Again, um, it gives it sort of a, a positive end when it's in ions, and we'll see them a lot in, of course, amino acids. And if you take a look at this amino acid, um, you can see that the amino acid has a two functional groups. It's got a carboxyl group here, and it's got an amino group here. So we can mix and match these things. We just don't, a molecule doesn't have to have one uh, functional group. We can have a bunch of them. Okay, another one is a sulfhydro group. This will be important with certain types of proteins where if you've got these sulfur groups close to each other, uh, sometimes those sulfur atoms actually want to attach to each other. And this is actually partially what's responsible for giving your hair its kinky uh, or curly sort of shape. If you've got curly or very tightly curled hair, it's actually a whole bunch of these bonds between these sulfur bonds, these disulfide bridges between different amino acids that are in your hair and it kind of gives it its kinks and turns and, and curls and we can force those and break those using heat or pH and, you know perms, curling irons, hair straighteners, that sort of thing. Okay then we've got the phosphate group. Uh, this is a mistake in formatting up here. You can see the phosphate group below. We would normally sort of draw that as, as PO4 uh, with a minus two attached to it, maybe I'll try and I'll draw that in real quick for you folks. So it would normally be P O four minus two. Hope that comes out pretty clearly there. Um, it's got phosphorus, very very polar with all these negative oxygens around it, and when we get into metabolism again we're going to see that these phosphate groups being very very negative are going to give us uh, the molecules that we cells use for energy such as ATP would be another example of a phosphate group at play in biological systems. And the methyl group is the other one we'll talk about uh, CH3 it's nonpolar it's a big deal okay? because those carbon hydrogen bonds they're all nonpolar covalent bonds. You don't have to worry about charges, so you don't have to worry about the fact of charge symmetry and all that's nonpolar. That's going to make it hard for a mo a harder for a molecule to dissolve in water. And anything, anytime you tack these methyl groups on, things become methylated. And these things occur in DNA, and this is how sort of your body helps turn on and turn off different genes to give you different characteristics because every cell in your body is by and large with some exceptions with your germline cells or your sex cells, eggs and sperm, are going to have the exact same set of chromosomes in terms of genes, A's, G's, C's and T's and the instructions of what they do. But turning these things on and off makes a cell a liver cell versus a muscle cell, for example. And part of the way of turning these things on and off are adding and taking off these methyl groups.